thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Spring Data Project, and more specifically, Spring Data Graph, and its use with the Neo4j Graph Database. I am the project lead of the Spring Data Open Source Project, and together with Emil Ephraim, who is the CEO and founder of Neo Technology, we'll be giving you a quick tour through graph databases and, more generally, the NoSQL uh, database landscape. I'd like to start off by introducing the Spring Data Project. It's a new open source umbrella project, meaning there are several sub-projects underneath it. Uh, this project was started about a year ago, uh, and its main goal is to simplify the development of applications that are using the new uh, data access technologies that have become quite popular in recent years uh, and go under the um, banner of NoSQL databases. Another goal of the Spring Data Project is sort of a refresh of the support that Spring has had traditionally for relational databases through such APIs as JDBC and JPA. And one important thing, as can be seen from the webinar we're doing today, we've worked very closely with the project leads and vendors behind a variety of technologies to ensure that we're right on track in providing good features and ease of use on top of the existing technologies. Uh, Spring Data, as you might expect, is promoting what we call classic Spring value propositions that you should all be familiar with if you're a Spring developer. Uh, one of which, of course, is productivity. And I like to think of this as making the easy stuff a one-liner. So if the main use case you're doing over and over again in the API is six lines of boilerplate code, we'll really streamline that for you and make it just a simple one-liner. Uh, however, the abstractions are never there to lock you in, or the convenience methods are never there to lock you in, and you always have access to the lower-level uh, APIs should you want to get at them. Consistency, uh, the new data access technologies are quite um, <clears throat> broad in terms of uh, their APIs, and Spring comes along to try and, as much as possible, give you a familiar feel for developing with them. Portability has also been a classic Spring Value proposition. This is a bit more difficult, obviously, uh, with the range of technologies we're talking about. Uh, but in as much as we can, we try to uh, achieve that goal, mostly with our repository support, which we'll be hearing about more later. Uh, this is all open source 2.0 and uh, Apache 2.0 license. And we are very open and welcoming to committers who want to contribute on a variety of these uh, sub-projects, which I'll now list. <clears throat> so these are the sub-projects that we have planned and are currently also under development. I've categorized them here roughly by the data type that, uh, of the data model. Sorry. And <clears throat> first off, you might be familiar, of course, with Amazon S3 or Blob Stores. Uh, there's a small project we have to interact with, with the Blob Store to get and retrieve information from there. And then moving on to more sort of traditional NoSQL databases, we have support for key value databases for React and Redis, for document databases such as MongoDB with CouchDB planned. Uh, also planned is integration with column family databases such as Cassandra and HBase. And the focus of this talk is the graph database Neo4j. Uh, also important to mention is if you're doing any uh, Hadoop related wor work, we have a dependency injection and POJO programming model for MapReduce jobs in Hadoop. And <clears throat> underneath it all, whenever we're converting from underlying data model in a particular database, we have a mapping project that we can reuse across them such that you can convert from your POJOs to the data structure of each target uh, database. And Emil will be going into much more detail to give you an overview of what the data model is here and where and why you might choose some databases over others. Some of the major themes that you'll see across the Spring Data Projects, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the mapping of POJOs to the underlying data model. So this makes it much easier to go from the classes that you're used to coding in your domain to storage. If you've used Spring at all, I'm sure you're used to hearing about JDBC template or JMS template or REST template. This sort of template callback style API uh, is also preserved in the Spring Data Projects. So we have things such as Redis template, Mongo template, and in this case, Neo4j template to make it very easy 
to do sort of the easy stuff in a one-liner. We'll also see uh, today, uh, but it's more broadly applicable, the idea of a repository interface that you can extend with custom finders, and Spring will provide the implementation. This gives you really a sort of zero implementation style coding way to access the database, and I think it will prove to be quite popular. We've been using more and more the Query DSL project, which allows you to have truly type safe data access in a very good syntactical way for uh, creating queries across a variety of uh, new database technologies. And last but not least, we'll also see an example later today of what we call cross store persistence. This is the term we use to describe an uh, entity, for example, let's say a JPA entity, that might have one or two fields that you would like to have managed in a different data store. So this cross store persistence allows you to deal with one domain model, but have its fields persisted and managed in different relational database, uh, different database technologies. So with that, I'd like to hand off the talk to Emil, who will first go over a little bit of the NoSQL database landscape, and then dive deep into what we've done together over the past 18 months, I think, or a year, of heavy coding around integrating Spring and Neo4j graph database. Emil? Thank you, Mark. Um, so my name is Emil Afram, and as Mark uh, mentioned, I'm the CEO of Neo Technology. And Neo Technology is the, the commercial sponsor uh, of the Neo4j open source uh, graph database project. Um, I am particularly excited to be here today because today is almost to the day one year um, after I uh, walked up to the VMware San Francisco office to sit down with Rod Johnson who, as you guys probably know, um, is the founder uh, of, of Spring, uh, to sit down with him and pair program what uh, turned out to be the, the first embryo of what today is Spring Data Graph. Um, and we, we spent, uh, we met a couple of times, four, five, six probably times across a month uh, to, to spike out the first implementation. Um, and fortunately, um, uh, much of this has since been replaced by real programmers. Um, in particular, uh, uh, Michael Hunger on the Neo4j team, um, David Montag also on the Neo4j team, as well as Mark and Thomas. Um, and that is what has given us what is today Spring Data Graph 1.0. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, dive deep into NoSQL um, and do a, a, a crash course overview. Um, but before, I just want to point out one, one strict guideline that I have for all my talks and, and webinars, which is I do not want your undivided attention. Um, if you have any feedback, please give it to me. Unfortunately, I cannot see the chat log. Uh, we have people monitoring it, um, and we will do a Q&A session afterwards. Um, also, um, I do monitor Twitter uh, religiously. Uh, so if you, if you have any feedback, please give it there. The only thing that I do ask is that you use the Neo4j hashtag and the Spring Data hashtag. Um, then we will be able to pick it up. So without further ado, um, let's dive into NoSQL. Um, NoSQL is incredibly popular. Some would say hyped, um, been, has been so since its inception in 2009. Um, and um, sometimes it seems like there's a new NoSQL project every week. Um, and however, if you squint a little bit, you can see that there's four main categories that sort of emerge. Um, and they are depicted here on the screen. They're key value, that they're big table clones or column family, uh, they're document databases, and they're graph databases. And a quick refresher uh, on each and every one of these four main categories. Key value stores in here lives projects like Voldemort or React, um, and they're all inspired by uh, this one paper, research paper out of uh, Amazon called Dynamo. And Dynamo outlined how Amazon managed to get to its amazing scale. Um, and they did so not by abandoning their relational database, um, but by augmenting it with a specialized type of storage, which in their case was um, a globally available distributed hash table. Um, so the um, data model of a key value store is basically that of a java.util.hash map but distributed and globally available. You have keys and you have values, and you put keys and you get keys, right? That's it. 
Um, very, very strong scale out characteristics, um, but uh, a very simplistic data model. Um, the second category of NoSQL is the column family store or big table clones. Um, and they're all based on the big table paper that was published by Google. Um, and the data model here is that of a big table, um, creatively enough. Uh, but the unique thing about this particular table model is that every individual row, at least in theory, uh, can have its own schema. You can have one row which has three columns um, and another row which has hundreds of columns. Uh, that's a really powerful model uh, that can capture semi-structured information, information which has a few mandatory attributes but many optional attributes. This is very pervasive on the web today. Example in this category is HBase, the Apache uh, project um, under the Hadoop umbrella, uh, Hypertable, which is a C++ clone of HBase, um, as well as Cassandra. And Cassandra is probably right now the most popular of the column family guys. The third category is that of document databases. And I think document databases um, here is uh, probably the most widely known uh, in the NoSQL space. Um, they're all based or inspired by Lotus Notes, actually, um, whom some of you might remember as not the greatest email client in the world. Um, but they actually have a pretty cool database. Um, and um, the, the guys behind CouchDB took that model upgraded it to the web era, added a RESTful API, um, incremental MapReduce views that you express in JavaScript, um, and really brought it to the 21st century. And the data model here is that you have documents, and you can think of the documents um, as basically um, java.util.maps, uh, so a, a collection of key-value pairs, although they're more typically represented as JSON. Um, and then you can take these documents and you can group them into collections. Um, most popular here today is by far MongoDB, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, but CouchDB is still around, and there's a bunch of other projects like TerraStore as well. And then the fourth and final category, and, and, and my little corner of this world, uh, is graph databases. Um, and we're going to talk much more about graph databases today. Um, the data model here quickly is nodes um, with typed relationships between them um, and then key value pairs that you can at attach to both nodes and to relationships. Examples here include the Sonus GraphDB, a .NET graph database, Infinite Graph, which is an, um, a graph database based on an object-oriented database, um, and then Neo4j. And Neo4j is obviously what we'll be spending the rest of this talk about. So four main categories, key value stores, column family stores, document databases, and graph databases. Everyone knows that NoSQL is all about scalability, and that is true. Uh, but what not as many people know is that there are actually two axes to scalability. One is scaling to size. How do you deal with, deal with more and more information that is roughly similar in its nature? Um, the, the other one is scaling to complexity. How do you deal with information that is more and more messy, more semi-structured, more connected? And if we map these four categories along these two axes, we can see that they're very dissimilar um, when it comes to their focus. The key value guys, they have chosen um, a very simple, some may call it simplistic uh, data model. Um, so it's really poor at representing complexity. Um, but the benefit they get from that is massive scalability. They can, really can push them to size. Um, the column family guys has, have, a, have a richer model. Um, they can represent the, the, um, the individual schema per row thing that we talked about before, which allows them to capture semi-structured information. So much richer model than the key value guys, um, but slightly less scalable. We have the document databases and all the way to the right, Awesome at handling complexity are graph databases, but more challenge to handle size. Um, the enemy of scaling to size is um, coupling of data, because if you have data that is very connected, it's difficult to achieve horizontal scalability and partition your data onto different machines. And graph databases are awesome at capturing connected data, because in the graph database world, we think that the world is connected. And if you don't have a model that that can express that, 
um, you're just fooling yourself. Um, but since we have a lot of couple data in graph databases, it's more difficult to get, get it to scale to size. 